Thank you, Laurent, for the introduction and also for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so as Laurent just said, I'm going to talk about sparse recovery and in particular mostly N1 norm minimization methods in situations where we don't have the randomized measurements that are um, assumed in compressed sensing. So I want to acknowledge this is funded by NSF. So this is a brief roadmap of the talk. First, I'm going to start by defining separable nonlinear inverse problems, or what we call SNL problems. Uh, then I'll explain how to apply sparse recovery, and in particular, something like N1 norm minimization for this class of problems. I'll talk in detail about two specific SNL problems, super-resolution and deconvolution. And then I'll finish by presenting some very recent work, we're still writing up the paper, on a general framework to derive guarantees for uh, more general SNL problems. Okay, so what's a separable nonlinear inverse problem, or SNL problem? It's a problem where our data Y can be written as a linear combination okay, of S components weighted by some coefficients, where what we're really interested in estimating are some parameters, theta. So each of the components just depends on one parameter. And there's a very nonlinear relationship between the value of the parameter and Y but that's just governed by a single function phi. Okay, so you can think of this maybe as the position of a source and this as a Green's function. And then you have several sources, the Green's functions are combined additively. Okay, and here we have n measurements. So a y is just a vector of dimension n, so that you can think of phi as the mapping from the value of the parameter of interest to these n measurements for one of the sources or one of the components, okay? And then the contribution of the S components, we're assuming that we just have S components that we're interested in, gets combined linearly. So essentially, it's kind of a generalization of a linear model where the nonlinearity is captured by what we could think of as just a Green's function. Are there any questions about, about this setup? So in particular, you can think of this as a matrix which depends on the parameters that we want to estimate times this vector of coefficients, and that's what gives you the data. But we don't know these parameters, okay? Any questions about the setup? So it turns out that we can model many problems of interest, of interest as SNL problems. Super resolution and deconvolution, which I'm going to talk about more in detail in a moment, but also source localization in EEG, direction of arrival in radar and sonar, and magnetic resonance fingerprint. Um, you're probably not as familiar with this last concept. Uh, magnetic resonance fingerprinting is a technique in quantitative MRI where we're interested in estimating magnetic relaxation time constants of tissues in a voxel in your body. And it turns out that those constants determine the time evolution of the magnetization in that pixel. So here, if it turns out that you have a tissue with a time constant of 120, you will see this time evolution of the magnetization in your pixel, or voxel, as they say in MRI. If it was 300, then it, you would see this other one. And sometimes you have several tissues within one voxel, and under certain assumptions, they combine additively, so that we have exactly an SNL problem where two of these guys are going to be combined additively, but what we're really after is this parameter, like these two parameters, is what we really want to estimate, okay? And again, the nonlinear relationship between the parameters we're interested in and the data is captured by the Green's function of a, in, in this case, of a certain differential equation. Any questions about that? This is just to show you that these ideas apply much more broadly than just in super resolution and deconvolution. Okay, so how can we apply sparse recovery for SNL problems? There's actually quite a few methods that you could use to tackle problems of this kind. You could just consider a least squares cost function and do gradient descent on the parameters. Typically what is going to happen there is that you're going to end up stuck very quickly in a local minimum. But you could think of variations of these methods that could actually work well and that's a very interesting research direction. Uh, in the case of super resolution, there's of course prony based methods or finite rate of innovation methods and Laurent has done some interesting work on that. Um, a possible drawback of these methods is that if your problem is 
different from super resolution, it might be difficult to apply this kind of techniques. Another option is to reformulate it as a sparse recovery problem, which is what I'm going to talk about right now. This also has drawbacks, and I promise to talk about them at the end of the talk. OK, so what's the idea to transform the setup that I described, be described before into a sparse recovery problem? Well, the idea is that we're going to linearize the problem by lifting it to a higher dimensional space. This is a very fancy way of just saying, I'm going to take my parameter space, I'm going to discretize it very finely, and that's going to give me possible Green's functions that could appear in my data, and I'm going to try to find a, sm a sparse linear combination of those possible Green's functions and fit them to, to my data. So it becomes a sparse linear model, essentially. So we would have a fine grid, these are the true parameters. There's only S of them. I'm going to assume that they are in my fine grid. If they're not, I'll have to deal with gridding error. And I could build a very large matrix where each column are the n measurements corresponding to a source located at that point of the grid. I'm assuming that only S will be active. So now that's going to be encoded in these coefficients. The non-zeros in the coefficients are going to tell me which parameters are actually active in the data. So now, basically, I have a highly underdetermined but linear inverse problem with sparsity constraints. Any questions about that? So now the idea is that I want to find a sparse vector of coefficients such that uh, y is equal to this matrix of discretized this discretized matrix of, of Green's functions times that vector of coefficients. It's an underdetermined linear inverse problem with a sparsity prior. Feel free to interrupt me if, if anything is not clear at any point. OK, so a popular approach to tackle these problems, as probably most of you know, is L1 norm minimization, where we choose the set of coefficients with the smallest L1 norm that is consistent with our data. This is a convex program that you can solve efficiently, at least in some cases, and a lot of people apply it in practice. So this was obviously not my idea. Uh, geophysicists starting applying, started applying this to um, the convolution problems in reflection seismography back in the 70s. Uh, it has been applied to EEG and other medical imaging problems. Here, Alan Wilski in ECS uh, has a really influential paper applying it to direction of arrival in radar and sonar, and there are many other examples. Uh, my own group at NYU has applied these ideas in collaboration with people in the medical school to tackle the magnetic resonance fingerprinting problem that I mentioned at the beginning, where again you have, so this is a cartoon of the problem, it, it gets much more complicated and I'm happy to talk about it offline, but the cartoon is that you have this data that is basically the sum of the time evolutions corresponding to two different tissues, and we want to find um, the constants for those, uh, for those tissues. We solve a discretized L1 norm problem, and we can find them in the absence of noise. Of course, if this is under uh, positivity constraints, which as Laurent knows, help a lot, and you have to do certain tricks when you have noise to actually obtain a sparse solution, so it's not as easy as it sounds, but in the noiseless case, uh, it actually works very well. Okay? And in the noisy case, you can, you can uh, obtain robust recovery. The point is that even though we observe in many applications that L1 norm minimization methods are quite effective, the current theory to analyze um, these methods uh, does not really apply because most of it is focused on um, randomized measurements, which are not relevant to the applications I just talked about. Okay, and that's basically the main motivation of this talk, to try to develop a theoretical framework to understand when this approach is going to work. So, um, an important point uh, which makes life a bit difficult is that we want to discretize very finely to make sure that we don't uh, miss the actual value of the parameter. And this means, as we will see in a moment, that our uh, our linear, our matrix that we're going to build is going to be very correlated locally. We're going to take this to the extreme. We're going to consider that we're uh, discretizing in, in, in such a fine way that we can just uh, consider the continuous dictionary. 
So we think of our parameters, let's just think of the 1D case, we have parameters that are in a continuous interval and we're going to allow for a, any value of the parameters in that continuous interval. Okay, in order to uh, now model our vector of coefficients, it can no longer be a vector, but we can model it as a sum of spikes or Dirac measures in that interval. And wherever we have a spike, that means that that parameter is active. So now we're going to change our signal model to a superposition of delta functions in order to be able to have a continuous dictionary instead of a vector. And now our model is like this. So instead of having a matrix, we have a linear operator, which you can think of as just a continuous dictionary that has n rows because we still have just n measurements. Okay, but it has an infinite number of columns uh, because we're considering continuous values of the parameters in an interval. Is that clear? But otherwise you can still think of it as a matrix. That's fine too. Okay, so now we want to find the sparse x such that um, our data is given by the action of this atomic measure on this continuous dictionary. And this is still an underdetermined linear inverse problem, even more underdetermined in a way, because we have infinite uh, possibilities to choose from with a sparsity prior. The problem now is because my signal is no longer a vector, okay, it consists of atomic measures, we cannot analyze the L1 norm, but uh, we can analyze something that is essentially equivalent. It's a continuous counterpart of the L1 norm, which is called the total variation norm. It's not the total variation of a piecewise constant function, which is a very common regularizer in image processing. It's essentially a continuous counterpart of the L1 norm. And we can actually define it in a way that shows this very quickly. You can think of the L1 norm of a vector as just the supremum of the inner product of the vector with uh, other vectors that have infinity norm bounded by one, okay? Because the L1 norm is the dual of the L infinity norm. Well, we can think of the total variation norm as the supremum of the action of this measure on, all, uh, on any function that has infinity norm bounded by one. Okay? The, these are continuous functions that have L infinity norm bounded by one. So essentially, you can just think of this as a continuous counterpart of the L1 norm. And in fact, if you look at the superposition of the Dirac measures, their total variation norm is equal to the L1 norm of their coefficients. Okay? So now the challenge is going to be analyzing this recovery algorithm where we minimize the total variation norm subject to this equality constraint, okay, which involves this continuous dictionary. And the question is, when can we expect this to achieve exact recovery? So in a lot of applied papers, when they consider this kind of models, they tend to reference compressed sensing. So some of you might be uh, wondering, isn't this just compressed sensing? Wasn't that just proved and, and that's it? Uh, well, it's really not because in compressed sensing the, the setup is similar, but there's a crucial difference. In compressed sensing, we want to recover an S sparse vector, so so far so good, from uh, with uh, so embedded in dimension M from just N measurements, where N is smaller than M. So we still have a fat matrix here, okay? So it's, in a, it's an underdetermined system and we have a sparsity constraint. In that sense, it's the same thing. The crucial difference is a key, that a key assumption for almost all of compressed sensing theory to apply is that this operator is random. And because of it being random, it satisfies properties such as the restricted isometry property with high probability, which essentially mean that when we restrict the action of the operator to only act on sparse vectors, it's going to preserve their norm. Okay, so just to make that clearer, the restricted isometry property um, for a certain matrix holds if for any S sparse vector X, when we apply the matrix to the sparse vector, its norm is, uh, is preserved. In particular, there cannot be any sparse vectors in the null space. This is really nice because imagine that you want to recover sparse signals from this kind of measurements, if you have two S sparse signals X1 and X2 and you are worried that they're going to give you the same data so you're not going to be able to make a difference between them because remember this is underdetermined. Um, if you look at the difference between the data 
coming from x2 and the data coming from x1, that's just equal to the action of the matrix on their difference. But now their difference can be at most 2s sparse. So if that matrix satisfies this, con this restricted isometry property with 2s, we know that the difference is going to be, the, the L2 norm of the difference is lower bounded by the L2 norm of the actual signals times a constant. So this essentially means that when you have randomized measurements, you don't have to worry about two sparse signals producing the same measurements. The thing is that for the SNL problems that I have just defined, even if you're on a grid, like forget about the continuous dictionary, we only make things worse. Even if you're on a grid, typically columns that are close, where you're just changing the parameter a little bit, are going to give you a Green's function that is almost the same. So you're not going to have the restricted isometry property even for 2s, sorry, for sparsity 2, because you have adjacent columns that are very correlated. And groups of columns are going to be completely ill-conditioned. So the RIP does not hold at all. You can have some sparse vectors that essentially produce almost the same data. So now what do we do? Well, uh, this makes clear that sparsity is not enough, but maybe under additional restrictions, we can still uh, show that things work out, okay? But the bottom line is that compressed sensing theory does not apply because in fact, general sparse recovery for this kind of dictionaries is impossible, at least in a stable way. Any questions up to here? Okay, so I'm going to talk about super resolution, which is a work that I started during my PhD with Emmanuel Candes at Stanford. Uh, the motivation here is that whenever you have an imaging device, the resolution at which you gather data is limited by diffraction, typically. Uh, and if you have a problem like this, where you want to image point sources from fluorescent probes to do fluorescence microscopy, uh, this is a problem. So here, um, you can think of this problem as you have a cell which you want to image, and there are some fluorescent probes shining randomly within the cell. You take a lot of frames, and the problem is that each time one of these fluorescent probes shines, if you look at it with your microscope, you're going to see a blur. Now, you put all of these frames together without doing anything, you see this, which is completely useless. But if you manage to super resolve the location of these fluorescent probes in each frame and then you put it together, then you get to see interesting structures in a cell. Okay, so here the idea, have a picture here, the idea is that you have some point sources which get blurred by a low pass filter and then your data looks like that and, and our goal is to find the locations of these point sources. Okay? If you look at it in the frequency domain, we don't get to see all of the spectrum of the signal because this filter basically kills the high pass frequencies. So we only get to see the low pass frequencies the low pass Fourier coefficients of these spikes. Okay? And the problem is uh, recovering this from those low pass Fourier coefficients. The mathematical model is basically that we have these spikes within an interval. We're looking at the 1D uh, case that have a certain amplitude and we get to see essentially their low pass Fourier coefficients where K here goes from minus the cutoff frequency to the cutoff frequency. Okay, this is exactly a, non a, sep a separable nonlinear problem uh, because we have so because of the, because this is a sum of these delta functions. Essentially, we're seeing a linear combination of these complex exponentials um, scaled by a constant. Okay, so in this case, this uh, Green's functions that I was considering are just complex exponentials. Okay, so, uh, sorry, trigonometric. Well, I mean, yeah. Any questions about this? Okay, so now we can ask two questions. First, is the problem well posed? Because I just told you that there's no restricted isometry property for this kind of problems, and this seems problematic because we have a highly underdetermined linear system, even if we have some sparsity constraints. And the second question is going to be, does total variation norm work out? So this is a cartoon of the problem. Think of this as an interval. So it's a continuous vector in a way, and we can have spikes here. And these are continuous dictionary. So it has n columns that are the n 
are going to give us each of the n Fourier coefficients that we measure. And each of the columns, we have a low-pass sinusoid. So here, very quickly, we see this phenomenon that I just mentioned, that if we consider the action of sparse vectors, we have to be very careful, because you could have vectors that are here, like, for example, 1 and minus 1, two spikes that are like this, very close, for which the measurements are going to be zero, because the corresponding columns can get arbitrarily close. Okay, so for those kind of signals, we are not going to be able to prove much about having recovery, especially robust recovery. But if we consider uh, signals, uh, signals that have support that, are, that is more spread out, then maybe there is hope. Okay? And that's a very simple but crucial idea. Let's not try to prove anything for general sparse signals. Let's uh, try to prove things for sparse signals that have a certain minimum separation in their support because maybe for them the problem is actually well posed. Okay? So, in this particular case of super resolution, if this separation is below 1 over the cutoff frequency, you can have this phenomenon where two signals give you almost the same data. If you're above 1 over the cutoff frequency, this no longer happens. This was proved uh, asymptotically by Slepian using proletispheroidal functions and non-asymptotically by Ankur a couple of years ago. Just to give you an idea of what I mean by 1 over the cutoff frequency, it's actually the width of this low-pass filter that we're convolving with the spikes. Okay? Um, twi it's twice the, what they call the Rayleigh distance in the literature sometimes. So just to make this point extremely clear, if you're only slightly below this threshold of 1 over the cutoff frequency, you, have situations, you can have situations like this, where you have two signals that are very different, and they give you almost the same data. So I'm going to put them on top of each other. These two signals, each of which have that minimum separation, give you this data, which is almost the same. The phenomenon uh, why this happens is that you have these sparse signals that are almost high pass. Almost all of the layer energy are in the high frequencies, which you don't get to sample. Okay? And again, this will not occur when the separation is above 1 over the cutoff frequency. Okay, so now we're interested in seeing, for this more restricted class of signals that have a certain minimum separation, does total variation norm minimization actually work? And the way, so the idea is we minimize the total variation norm subject to this linear measurement. So the way we're going to prove that it actually works out in certain cases is by building a dual certificate, which is a technique that was taken for compressed sensing. So, I mean, the intuition and some of the techniques from compressed sensing can be very useful. It's just that they don't apply just naively to this kind of settings. Okay, so what is a dual certificate? Just intuitively, a dual certificate is a dual variable that is feasible for the dual problem of the one we're interested in and which essentially guarantees that your original signal that you want to recover achieves the smallest possible value of the primal cost function. Okay, that's what's happening intuitively. Um, in this case, because of the particular form of the total variation norm, uh, we have that a dual certificate associated uh, to, a sum of, to a superposition of delta functions is of the following form. It's equal to V transpose times phi of theta, so it's a function of theta. So you can think of it as just a functional at an interval. Uh, you can think of this condition as the dual, like as, as this, what, what we call the dual combination or the dual function. You can think of it as being in the row space of this dictionary. It's a linear combination of this n rows of your continuous dictionary. Okay? Uh, we'll see in a moment why that's important, <coughs> but it's of this form. Okay? Um, now, because we're considering the total variation norm, the dual certificate, well, the dual function that we construct with the dual certificate has to be equal to the sign pattern of the spikes that we want to recover on their support and has to be bounded by one on the off support. If, that, um, if this object exists, then total variation norm minimization works. And up to now, I haven't restricted myself to talking about the super resolution problem. So this would actually work for any SNL problem as long as we manage to build this object for that particular phi function. 
uh, measures in an interval. All, all kinds of measures. Yeah, so we could, like basically what happens in practice, except for super resolution. So for super resolution, you can just set it up as an SDP and solve the dual and find the locations of the measures. So you can actually solve that problem specifically. In general, we just discretize and do L1 norm minimization. The reason why we're um, analyzing this particular problem is that we want to deal with arbitrarily fine grids. But this is a very good question. Any other questions? Okay, so if we can build this object, uh, this means that for this particular signal, we know that total variation norm minimization is going to recover it. Is that clear? Why is that the case? Well, imagine that you have another feasible signal. If we have another feasible signal, we can, uh, we can express it as the original signal plus something that is in the null space of our measurement operator. Okay? So now we have the total variation of this other feasible signal and we, we can express it as the supremum over all continuous functions bounded by one. Okay? And now the application of X on F and H on F. Okay? In particular, we can plug in Q because this uh, object that we are assuming exists, as we will see, it's a bit difficult to actually construct them, but let's assume that it exists. We can plug it in there because it's bounded by one. And now, because of the conditions that we have imposed here, this thing is equal to the sign pattern of X on its support, and it's strictly bounded by one on the off support. And we can write it in this way, as a linear combination of the rows of this continuous dictionary. So here, basically, we have that when we consider it's actually like its interaction with X, we can just restrict Q to the places where X is non-zero. There, we know that this is just going to be the sign of CJ. And here, we can just replace Q by um, V transpose phi of theta. And what happens is, here on the left, this is equal to the sign of CJ. So you're just going to get the L1 norm of the coefficients. That's the total variation norm of X. And here we know that this guy is in the null space. So it's gone. Okay? This is just basically showing you very quickly uh, why the existence of the dual variable shows you that uh, the original signal has the smallest possible total variation norm. Um, doing a little bit more work, if you are able to do this for any sign pattern, this, this implies actually that you have the unique solution because of the strict inequality on the off support. But I'm not going to get into that. It's not too difficult to prove. Okay? The point is that if we can build these linear combinations of the rows of the continuous dictionary that interpolates the sign patterns of the spikes, we're good to go. For any SNL problem, the problem, of course, is, is actually doing that for specific ones. In the case of super resolution, this row space is spanned by low pass sinusoids. Okay? This Q function that I've been talking about, you can think of it as just a linear combination of low pass sinusoids. Um, now, we would like to show that for any sparse signal that has a minimum separation above the minimum separation that we know is needed for the problem to be well posed, we would like to show that a dual certificate exists. If we manage to do that, then we've shown that total variation or minimization recovers such, such, that class of signals. Uh, interestingly, here we see immediately why this minimum separation is helping us. Because if we want to show that you can always use a low pass trigonometric polynomial to interpolate a sign pattern, if you make this change very rapidly and you push them together, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the trigonometric, to, to find a trigonometric polynomial that interpolates that and doesn't shoot off beyond uh, the, um, the, bound on, sorry, the, uh, the bound on its amplitude. It's going to have amplitude bigger than one very quickly. But if things are spread out, you can probably find a low-pass polynomial that does the job. A possible way of doing that is just taking a Fedger kernel. We, we use something a little bit different, but it's the same idea, and interpolating the sign pattern. Okay, and technical comment that is not too important is that that actually doesn't completely work because locally you're going to still uh, violate this annoying uh, amplitude condition that you have to be strictly bounded by one. But you can correct this by adding a correction term that involves the derivative 
of whatever kernel you're using to interpolate, which is also a low pass trigonometric polynomial, so that's fine. And forcing the derivative at those points to be zero. And that actually works out. Okay, but the idea is that we know we want to interpolate this sign pattern with a low pass trigonometric polynomial, you can use some fast decaying kernel to do it and then do some corrections. This is the technique that we use to prove that super resolution works out for a minimum separation of 2 over the cutoff frequency in 1D and 2.38 over the cutoff frequency in 2D. More recently, I've sharpened the first result to 1.26, which is kind of significant because we know that under 1 over the cutoff frequency, the problem becomes ill-posed. And numerically, we actually observe that L1 norm minimization works until that threshold of 1 over the cutoff frequency. So in this case, because we know the operator well and we can do some harmonic analysis and we have these decaying kernels, we can obtain very sharp guarantees on the behavior of the optimization-based uh, recovery method that seem to match numerics uh, pretty well. Any questions about this part? So these new guarantees constructed into a certificate differently? Yeah, it's, it gets a bit technical. The main idea, though, is, is rather similar. Okay. Any other questions? OK, so now I'm going to talk about deconvolution. Uh, this joint work with my PhD student, Brett Bernstein, at Courant. Now, Laurent is going to forgive me for <laughs> giving a, an extremely simplistic cartoon of reflection seismology. Um, so basically, reflection seismology you want to estimate what layers you have below the Earth's surface. And this is just a cartoon. Again, you want to find the layers. You want to know if there's oil here. And you can do that by uh, characterizing the acoustic impedance of the layers, or equivalently, the reflection coefficients at the interface between the layers. And an extremely cartoonish and simplistic model of this would be sending a sound wave down and recording the reflections up in the surface. And we're just going to look at the, again, extremely simplified 1D uh, problem where you want to find these reflection coefficients at a certain point. And there's some assumptions. You can model this as the convolution between the sound poles and these reflection coefficients. Okay? And again, Laurent uh, treats this problem in a much, much more sophisticated way that uh, reveals even more interesting stuff. But so for the here, purpose. You get to design the uh, I'm going to assume that you know the pulse, not that you have designed it, okay? And in particular, yeah, so I, that's a good segue. I'm going to assume that we have a pulse that looks something like this, which is a Ricker wavelet, which is sometimes used in, in seismography to model these kinds of things. We're also going to study uh, Gaussian pulses because we're also interested in seeing what these things could do for imaging. So the cartoon problem that we actually analyze is we have some spikes they get convolved by this Ricker wavelet. And now we only get to see samples, because I told you at the beginning, we only have to end samples from these SNL problems. Yeah, now the idea is, where are the, the spikes? And in particular, the question that we were interested in is, under what conditions on these samples, if we allow for non-uniform sampling, can we recover the sources? In particular, by applying total variation or minimization. So, unsurprisingly, this can be modeled as an SNL problem where the parameters are, again, the locations of those spikes. But now we have changed the measurement operator to essentially be uh, so that the, the Green's function is essentially this kernel, but sampled, okay, and centered uh, at the particular theta. So we're choosing between kernels centered at each possible location that could give us the measurements, and then sampled. If we want to think about it in terms of this continuous dictionary, now the rows of the dictionary are going to be also the same kernel, because of this symmetry that there is in the convolution, centered at the samples. And this will become important in a moment. Is the measurement model clear? Okay, so Two same questions as for super resolution. When is this problem well posed? When can we hope to recover? And does total variation norm minimization uh, do its job? So it turns out that for these smooth kernels, um, we are also losing the high frequency. 
and because of the same um, argument as in super resolution, we're going to need some separation between the spikes. Um, if we think about the location of the samples, at the bare minimum, we need two samples per spike because there's two quantities that we need to estimate, the location of the spike and the amplitude. So that's really the bare minimum. Because the convolution kernels, the Gaussian and the Ricker kernels, decay, we argue that to be robust, you're going to need two samples that are somewhat close to each spike. If you have a spike for which you don't have samples that are close, it's going to be very difficult to recover that spike. Not impossible, but, but difficult. Because of this, we enforce a sample proximity condition where we say that for each spike, there must be at least two samples that are gamma, where gamma is a constant, close to that particular spike. So we consider any arbitrary non-uniform sampling pattern as long as it contains two samples that are close to each spike. It could contain no other samples. That's, of course, impossible because you don't know where the spikes are. So you're going to be lucky enough to have two samples on top of each spike and nothing else. But uh, again, we just consider any non-uniform sampling pattern that at least has two samples close to each spike. So now let's ask, does total variation norm minimization work? And we're going to use exactly the same um, proof technique based on dual certificates to show that under what conditions the original signal is the solution to that optimization problem. So we have the same dual certificate except that now we want to replace the Green's function here by this sampled convolution kernel. And as I was saying before, you can interpret this as this guy being a linear combination of the convolution kernel but fixed at the sample locations. In super resolution, because we had low pass trigonometric polynomials, we could consider Fraser kernels that were shifted wherever you wanted them to be shifted. Now we don't have that luxury anymore. We want to uh, be able to interpolate the sign pattern of this guy with kernels that are going to be centered at the samples that we have, at the end samples that we have. That's what we need to do if we want to build a dual certificate. Since we have the sampling proximity condition, something that we can do is we can say, okay, forget every other sample. Okay, just consider the two samples that are close to each spike. This gives me some degrees of freedom. How about I, I take a linear combination of the kernel centered at those samples and I enforce two things. First, that I interpolate the sign pattern and second, that the derivative is zero. And this is because of this technical condition that you'd want to locally not violate um, the amplitude condition. Okay, so if you do that, it works very well. Okay, this is for the Gaussian kernel and this is for the Ricker wavelet. So the situation is this, okay, you want to interpolate here, here and here, okay, maybe here, like it's, it's more difficult to show with the Ricker wavelet because of all the things. And you are basically reweighing these Gaussian kernels that are fixed at the sample locations so that it works out. This is extremely difficult to analyze in this form because the amplitudes of these guys depend on the relative position of the samples with respect to the spikes. And the only thing we're saying is that they have to be within a certain gamma. That's all. So this is actually very difficult to analyze. However, we do a reparametrization trick to make this so, so that we can analyze it for general uh, problems with a certain minimum separation. The idea is that we reparameterize these uh, fixed kernels as what we call bumps and waves. So this is better seen through a picture. We get these two kernels that are at two locations that we know cannot be very far from this particular spike, and we add them together to make a bump that is centered at the particular spike. We still have one degree of freedom, and we know that we're going to have to correct the derivative, so we make a wave by uh, adding one plus uh, the other one multiplied by minus one. And this wave is going to be linear exactly here, but zero at the spike. So now basically you can think of this as just a change of variables. Instead of having these two kernels at those two points, I have these two other functions. One is a bump and the other one is a wave. And we can do exactly the same thing for the Ricker wavelet. The bump looks a little bit weirder and that's the wave. 
So now when I consider this linear combination that has to interpolate, we can actually show that when we express it in terms of bumps and waves, the coefficients on the bumps are just the sign pattern, almost, and the coefficients on the waves are very, very small. So we can analyze this thing and, and obtain sharp recovery guarantees. So the picture is this. We had to analyze this, but we reparameterize in terms of bumps and waves. And boom, we get a bump at each point, and the waves are very, very small. And we can do the same thing for the Ricoeur wavelet. This would be a nightmare to analyze. But if we reformulate it in terms of bumps and waves, we just have a bump on top of each spike. Okay. Using this technique, we obtain quite sharp, guarantee, uh, sharp characterization of the, um, of the performance of the method. So this is the spike separation. Okay, we assume that we have a Gaussian with standard deviation one, and the problem completely scales if you want to change to other standard deviations. And these are the sample proximities that we consider. We observe exact recovery in this region, and we can prove down to this region using the technique that I just showed you. And this is what we can prove for the recur kernel. Any questions about deconvolution? Okay, so now I have shown you how through uh, quite a bit of suffering, you can actually use your knowledge about these particular operators to construct dual certificates and show under what conditions total variation norm minimization works. But it would be very nice to have more general guarantees for more general SNL problems. Why? Because in a lot of these problems, okay, this joint work with Brett again and with Sheng Liu, who is a master's student at CDS, but is going to join us as a PhD student next year. We would like to be able to characterize more general SNL problems because if you remember this magnetic resonance fingerprinting problem that I was telling you about, this dictionary we actually build it by solving the block equations numerically. So we're not going to be able to have is such a tight um, handle on it to be able to prove anything theoretically for that particular dictionary, but it would be nice to have general guarantees that for these kinds of problems, things are going to be okay. Other examples where we have uh, dictionaries that are computed numerically include source localization in EEG, where you have to worry about the geometry of the head of the person that you're actually imaging. Direction of arrival in radar or sonar, where you have different media and also different arrays of antenna and the, the problem that I just mentioned, magnetic resonance fingerprinting. Okay? So the idea is that it would be very nice to obtain uh, guarantees in the same spirit for more general SNL problems. Again, just so that we, we remember, we're modeling these SNL problems as Dirac measures in the parameter space. We want to recover these parameters, and we have these Dirac measures that tell you which parameters are active. And what we get to see is the action of this continuous dictionary, okay, uh, interacting with the spikes. So these are just two cartoon problems uh, that we're go I'm going to use to illustrate uh, our general framework. Imagine that you have a rod with varying conductivity and you know that you have some sources. Okay, so maybe we have a source here so that the heat diffuses. And then we have a source there, it has negative amplitude because it's a toy problem, but Anyways, uh, here the heat diffuses much quicker, here it diffuses more slowly, and here it diffuses very, very slowly. Okay, and now we sample this and we want to find where the sources were. You could construct this uh, dictionary that, I, I mean, that we discussed before uh, that gives you basically the, um, this, so that gives you basically uh, this greens function for every possible location and then do sparse recovery to find the coefficients, but we wouldn't have any uh, recovery guarantees because the theory that I've been talking about is for very specific operators. A similar problem would be you have a time frequency dictionary and you see a superposition of um, some functions from a time frequency dictionary and then you sample them and you want to know which ones you have. In this particular cartoon problem, uh, the parameter basically tells you the position on this line, but also the frequency. So when we go to the right, we have higher frequency atoms. You would definitely consider a 2D case here, but just for the sake of illustration, this is a very dumb 1D time frequency dictionary. The point is that you could get weird situations like this, 
where you, we would like to know, basically, whether total variation norm or any other method is actually going to work out. So how can we do this? We cannot apply general sparse recovery results because uh, these dictionaries that we're considering are, again, very correlated locally when you're close in parameter space. So you're not going to have the restricted isometry property or anything like that, um, even if you discretize. So you cannot hope to recover all sparse signals. But now, from our intuition that we have gathered looking at the convolution and super resolution, it seems reasonable that if you're well separated in parameter space with respect to the correlations in your uh, infinite dictionary, then you're probably going to be OK. okay so set in, other, in another way, if you have like a set of signals for which the relevant parameters are, uh, have Green's functions that are not very correlated between them, things may work out because they do in super resolution and deconvolution. So now the challenge is trying to prove something for general SNL problems uh, where we only assume that we know their correlation structure, not the actual columns themselves, or not the actual Green's functions themselves, which is what we did for the convolutions and super resolution. So in order to do this, we consider a class of signals uh, that, have, uh, that, have certain, that satisfy certain conditions with respect to what we call their support-centered correlations. So the support-centered correlation is just the correlation at each point. So rho i of theta is the support-centered correlation at i. We assume that theta i is one of the active parameters, and we look at the correlation of its Green's function with all the other Green's functions in the dictionary. Okay. So for example, if we consider these three Green's functions in the dictionary with the varying conductivity, this is the correlation, uh, the support um, centered correlation for the first one, this is the support centered correlation for the second one, and this is the support centered correlation for the third one. How do we build this curve? Well, basically, you look at this Green's function, then you shift this a little bit, you do look at that Green's functions, you take the correlation between them, and now you do it for all the values of theta. Okay? And when you're far away enough, uh, you have decay in this particular case, and for many practical problems. So now the question is going to be, if these guys are separated with respect to these correlations in the dictionary, are things okay? Is that clear? Any questions? So the same thing for our time frequency dictionary. Uh, these are the actual Green's functions, which are just, no, just these values. We can look at their correlations when we shift these centers. And for these three atoms, we get things like this. They look extremely weird, but they are decaying eventually. And again, this is the case for many problems of interest. So in order to characterize this theoretically, we place some correlation decay assumptions on the support-centered correlation of a, of, of, of a general dictionary, where basically we have these parameters. We have a near region where the correlations almost become one. So we assume that we're going to be concave there because you have to approach one because you're correlated one with yourself and things are continuous. We are assuming that we have smooth green functions. Then we have an intermediate region where we allow this thing to get as weird as it wants, but bounded. Okay, so there's an intermediate region with this where we're going to assume that this is bounded. And then we have a faraway region where there's going to be a decay that we assume to be exponential, but could be quadratic or could be something else at, at, as long as it's summable at the end of the day. Okay, this is the general class of, uh, this, how we, uh, this is how we characterize a general class of SNL problems that, exp that have a certain correlation decay in their dictionary structure. Okay, so this is saying exactly what I said, where they're concave in this near region, they're bounded, and then they decay. So a technical uh, issue is that we also, when we get to the proofs, we also need a decay condition on the derivatives of this support-centered correlation. And a very interesting open question is, is this necessary? We can build some counterexamples that show that if your correlation is not very smooth, you're going to run into problems, but we don't have I wouldn't say that we completely understand why we also need a decay in the derivatives of the correlation between atoms. 
that's, that's not very intuitive. It could be that it's just going to shift your solution slightly, and this is what we observe in some examples, but again, I wouldn't say that we have characterized that completely. But for now, we're just going to assume it. We have also a decay uh, in, the, in the derivatives of the support-centered correlations. Okay, so now basically, we're going to assume a minimum separation condition that depends on the separation between the spikes and this area where things start to be bounded, okay? that is uh, basically normalized by the decay of the correlation at each point. So we're going to allow, as in the varying conductivity case, for the correlations to decay in different ways. But of course, we're going to uh, take this into account in the minimum separation. Things decay quickly, things can be closer. If, things, if the correlation doesn't decay as quickly, you have to be farther apart. Okay? This is how the condition looks like. But the main point is that, normalized by the decay of each point, you have to be spread out, which is what we, the, the same kind of conditions that we were assuming in the convolution and super resolution. And now the point is that for any SNL problem that has that, that decaying correlation, and again, also derivatives with, so derivative, um, a, correlation, a support center correlation that has derivatives that decay, and that's perhaps the part that is a bit uh, less satisfying at this point, Total variation norm minimization achieves exact recovery under the separation conditions with a, sep a normalized separation that is just a constant, which depends on the decay bounds, like how curved you are locally for the correlation, how bounded you are, and the constant in front of the decay. Okay? And again, you could change this to things that are not exponential decay. We just wanted uh, a statement that was easier to, to state. And we're not looking for sharpness because we're considering really general dictionaries. As we have seen, if you actually use the fact that you know your dictionary in some cases, you can get much, much sharper results. So how do we prove this? We basically, like probably unsurprisingly, just build a dual certificate. Um, in this case, we are going to not, uh, we're, we're not going to have a tight handle on this guy. We're going to build a dual certificate that basically is a linear combination of the support-centered correlations. And this works out, except that you also need the derivatives to correct and so on, but that's the same technical detail. What you should probably be ask, asking yourselves is why can I use the support-centered correlations and still get a valid dual variable? And that's the main insight that uh, makes this whole framework possible. Well. I mean, just by definition, the support-centered correlation is the inner product between phi at theta i and phi of theta. So you are in the row space of your measurement operator, okay? Where the v function, the dual variable, is equal to this for the coefficients that allow you to interpolate. And again, there's the technical aspect that you have to also use the derivative of the support-centered correlation to correct the derivative. And that's why we have this, this additional condition. Okay, so I haven't talked about robustness at all, but it turns out that you can build some variations of these tool certificates to establish robustness. Some work that I did with Emmanuel and then by myself and also with my PhD student. Um, I haven't talked about outliers, but you can also deal with them within this framework. And this is some work we did with Kong Tang at Colorado School of Mines and, and with some people at Columbia. But there are some interesting open questions in that direction, which would be analysis of higher noise levels, discretization error, and also a better understanding of robustness for positive amplitudes, uh, which is some work that Laurent has done. I promised to talk about drawbacks of this method. Well, solving this convex program is actually computationally expensive. And it becomes infeasible when you go to higher dimensions. So in particular, in the magnetic resonance fingerprinting project, we're looking at two relaxation constants. There are things that are under control. If you have more parameters in your differential equation that you're using to model the system, very soon your dictionary would explode. You cannot build this dictionary and solve your optimization method and apply the optimization method. Um, also, in practice, when we look at robustness to noise, the current uh, guarantees uh, only apply for very small noise for a reason, because we see that the sparse solutions that we get from L1 norm minimization problems are not great in the sense that they can be greatly enhanced by techniques such as reweighting, which are not very well understood theoretically. So it would be 
Very interesting to analyze other techniques such as reweighting methods or maybe the send methods on non-convex cost functions for these SNL problems that I've been talking about. And in that sense, I think that the contribution here, uh, apart from showing you why L1 norm minimization methods, which are widely applied in practice, are probably a good idea if you manage to run them, the contribution is also to show that the problem is well posed in the sense that we have an algorithm that probably can solve it under some reasonable conditions on separation and so on. Now you can go and design better methods for the particular applications that would not necessarily just use L1 norm minimization. So as a conclusion, previ previous theory on sparse recovery focuses mostly on random operators because of the great successes in compressed sensing, but for a lot of deterministic problems, sparsity is not enough. However, uh, imposing some separation conditions that have to do with the correlation structure of the dictionary allow you on the ha one hand to derive very sharp guarantees for what you can do in super resolution and the convolution and on the other it has allowed us to develop a general framework to understand where some uh, classes of SNL problems can be solved. And now these are just some references. Thank you. So, I mean, that's an interesting question because in this final part, we don't really have uh, theoretical results that tell us when things are well conditioned or not, as we have in the super resolution case, where Anchor, for example, has actually gone and analyzed the restricted, what you can think of as the restricted singular values. Here, we actually don't know, but the fact that we can have a method that has exact recovery guarantees and some robustness indicates that that must be the case under these separation conditions just on the pairwise correlations, which is kind of interesting. So is that the risk of this assumption that you make? Do you think it's to get a good lower bound on the particular value or to get a sharp upper bound on the upper on the, on the value? I think what the derivative condition does is it precludes you from having small shifts happening in the location of your of your solution. I think that's what's happening. Is it conceivable that for some of the models that you showed that you could actually take the data and interpolate it between? The samples? Yeah. yeah, so this is what people do for deconvolution if they want to apply things like FRI right. or right. right. prony based methods. Uh, the farther away you get from that, that, like when you don't have convolution anymore, where you have like this varying convolutions which happens in the diffusion case, mm -hmm. then it becomes much harder. But you could think of methods like that. <laughs> 